strange times these are. Jesus said in the last days there would be strange signs. It's been a it's been a strange week. Anybody have a strange week? Last week the strongest earthquake in twenty five years hit Taiwan. Last Wednesday it was. Not extremely out of the ordinary. It's a region that gets a lot of earthquakes. But then on Friday, a 4.8 earthquake tore through New Jersey. The strongest in that region in 144 years. Lightning struck the Statue of Liberty. Lightning strikes it pretty regularly, but any one of these things by themselves is not astonishing, but all in the same week. Wars rage between Russia and Ukraine, between Israel and Gaza. Rumors of war are present with Lebanon, Iran, and Jordan. You put all those together, it sounds like what Jesus said in Luke 21, 9 through 11. They asked him about the end of times, about his return, about when he was going to come again. And he said, well, when you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Tomorrow, millions of Americans will travel to follow a line that's going to stretch across the country uh, for the eclipse. You can't get an Airbnb or a hotel room in the Texas Hill Country because people coming in from everywhere to see it. And you put it all together, it's strange. If you're remotely sensitive at all, if you don't just have blinders on as you go through life, if you're a spiritual person, strange. Does it mean that the Lord Jesus is about to, to come back to the earth? I don't know. But I'd like to reverse the question. Instead of saying, does this mean that the Lord Jesus is about to come back to the earth? How about we reverse it and say, because of all this, will the earth finally come back to the Lord Jesus? Will all of the signs and the announcements and the things that are happening around us, will it Will it stir our hearts to come to Jesus? What about you? I know, I can tell without even talking to you. I know you've been going through some strange things in your life. Strange troubles, strange stress and anxiety, strange difficulties. Been through things this year you've never been through before in your life. Could it be another sign along with the earthquakes and along with the strange weather, along with an eclipse, along with celestial things happening in the heavens? Could it be a sign that it's time for you to, to come back to Jesus? In Revelation chapter 22, in our text, Jesus said, look. That's the first word of the text in Revelation. Look. Look, signs are there to make you look. Have you seen anything lately? Signs are there to grab your attention, to make you take notice. Have you, have you seen anything lately? The loss of life is so present all around us. Stone Oak Parkway, a mama and her little child walking across the crosswalk and Drunk driver in an Audi flipped up over the, the partition and, and just killed them both instantly. 
Ha have you seen anything lately? A bus full of elementary school kids going on a field trip and uh, somebody crossed over into their lane. So many lives. Have you seen anything lately that, that bids you to come? He says, look, I am coming soon. Now, you say, Pastor, Jesus said that 2,000 years ago. What do you mean soon? Seems like it ain't going to happen. Hadn't happened yet. What do you mean soon? But you got to understand, that's a little bit arrogant to say and a little bit petulant to say. Kind of like spoiled child, you know. Because soon is relative to God and his timing not ours. And the best way I can illustrate it to you is every year I preach through California. There's a couple of churches that like to have me every year. And so what I do is I'll preach at one of those churches on one Sunday and then I'll stay there the whole week and then preach at the other one. And what we do is it's always in the summer. So we take our kids and we have a little family vacation in between the bookends of the preaching engagements. And there's a couple of places in California that my boys just think are heaven. They're, they are their favorite places to go to. And inevitably, uh, these churches will call to book me, you know, in January, February, something like that. And the kids will overhear me on the phone or they'll overhear me and Katie talking about the plans, the flights, the where we're going to stay and all this kind of stuff. And they will get word that we're going to California. And there's... There's no other question that we hear every day, several times a day. When are we going to California? And inevitably, uh, their mother and I will look at them and smile and say, soon. soon. <laughs> now to a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old. June, that's forever. Because they measure time in seconds and minutes. Well, Katie and I measure time in Sundays. We kind of build our calendar, build our lives, build our clocks around Sundays. So what seems like forever to my boys, for me and Katie, we look at it and we say, it's seven Sundays away. Seven sermons, seven praise and worship set lists that she has to, it's seven Sundays away because that's how we measure time. And so when Jesus says soon, he's speaking soon as it relates to him and his time, not as it relates to our time and our perspective of it. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. In light of everything we're seeing, in light of all that's going on in our world, in light of your life, what difference does it make when Jesus comes? Think about it. What difference does it make? Whether it's tomorrow, somebody, some preacher said it'd be like, you know, tomorrow that Everybody would be looking up in the clouds at the eclipse. And Jesus would just come floating down on the clouds while everyone in the earth is looking up. And it would just be so beautiful. Maybe. You know, maybe. But what difference does it make? Whether it's tomorrow or 50 years from now. The point is not when he comes. The point is he said, look, I am coming. And signs are there to warn you. Signs are there to announce to you. Signs are there to remind you. He is coming. And then the text says in Revelation, he's not coming alone. He says, look, I am coming soon and my reward is with me. And I will give to each person according 
to what they have done. That's not a judgment scripture. It's a grace scripture. Jesus has said, I'm, he said, I'm coming and I'm not coming alone. I'm coming with a reward for each person to give them according to what they have done. This reminds us that Jesus is a rewarder. That's one of the first things that Hebrews told us. You had to believe about God before you even get saved. You have to come to him believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I will give to each person according to what they have done. That scripture encourages me so much. And to every believer who has ever felt like your labor was in vain, God's coming back with rewards. Jesus is coming back with rewards. And I'm glad he is because sometimes people can receive things from you a whole lot better than they'll give things to you. They can receive your charity. They can receive your kindness. They can receive your help. They can receive your encouragement. They can receive your strength. And then you turn around and need something and nobody's standing there. If you've ever been frustrated because you helped people that didn't help you back and you gave to people that didn't give back to you. Don't be discouraged. Jesus keeps excellent records. And I want to tell you, he is coming back and he's coming back with rewards. Every prayer you've prayed in faith, your labor was not in vain. Every tear you cried in faithfulness, your labor was not in vain. Every act of service you did for people, even if nobody patted you on the back and said, thank you. Your labor is not in vain. Every dollar you've given to support the kingdom of God, your labor is not in vain. He says, I will give to each person. Look at it in the text. I will give to each person. Look at it again. I will give to each person according to what they have done. I love it because that reminds me that he is an individualistic person personal Jesus, not some corporate Jesus, that blessings are individual and they are personal, that my blessing has my name on it. Oh, that's, that's, that's encouraging right there. My blessing has my name on it. And then verse 13, he says, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's not just listing titles. He's telling you something about him. He's telling you something about his coming. He's reminding you not to get discouraged and cast away your hope in the middle of your journey or in the middle of a transition. So many people have told me, Pastor, pray for me. I'm going through transition this year. I'm going through transition in my relationship, transition in my home, transition in my health. I'm in that in-between, uncomfortable place. I've been crying. I've been depressed. I've been sensitive. I've been anxious because for some reason it started in January. I've just been going through this transition. And to all of the people that are in a painful transition, if things starting to look different in the landscape of your life, if somebody left you or somebody died or somebody moved on, if a relationship's been severed, if your job situation is, is shaky and you don't know which way it's going to go, I want to encourage everyone with what Jesus said. He said, I'm the alpha but I'm also the Omega. In other words, I wouldn't start something with you and leave you in the middle. I wouldn't start ministering to the earth in Palestine in the year 33. I wouldn't start going to a cross and going to the whipping post. I wouldn't start all of that and then not return and come back and get you, redeem you, secure you, and take you as my own. God doesn't quit in the middle. He said, I'm the Alpha and Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the first and I am the last. That means if he ever did anything in your life, you can guarantee he will continue the work he started. If you ever got one blessing from God, if he ever answered one prayer, it's a guarantee that another answer is coming because God doesn't do one-offs. God doesn't do one-night stands. If he started something with you, I feel this thing. If he started something with you 
He said, the proof that I'm coming back is that I came in the first place. I never would have been born from a virgin. I never would have been prophesied of by John the Baptist. I never would have started working miracles and healing blinded eyes if I did not have the intention to finish this thing all the way through. He says, verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes. That they might have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. What does this mean? He talked about it in the previous chapter. Washing your robes means washing in the blood of the lamb. Believing that Jesus is who the gospel says he is. And having the blood that he shed at Calvary applied to your heart by faith in him, repenting, turning from yourself and your ways and turning to him and trusting him with all of your heart and receiving the Lord Jesus. That's how you wash your robes. There's a whole lot of people that need their robes washed and religion will not do it. Keeping rules will not do it. A denomination will not do it. You have to come to Jesus. You have to come to Jesus. I don't know who needs to hear it. You have to come to Jesus. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you wholly trusted in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you come to Jesus to have the stains removed off of you? To have the guilt and the shame removed off of you? If you have, the text says, you are blessed. Blessed are those who wash their robes. That they might have the right. The washing of the robe, that that isn't the, the best part. The church has preached salvation as if salvation and the forgiveness of sins is the best part. That's not the best part. Washing your robe grants you access into a city called heaven. It's a real place. It's a physical reality. It's not some mystical, spiritual idea. It's a real place. And washing your robes grants you access to that city. Verse 15, he said, outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Verse 16, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel. That word angel doesn't mean a winged, flying, supernatural creature from heaven. It's the Greek word angelos. It means a sent messenger with a sent message. Understand the importance of this. I'm almost done. Almost time to eat. Sent messenger with a sent message. Uh, Indulge me. Say sent messenger. Sent message. Jesus said, I've got a message. I've got a testimony. I've got something to say. Now, then he says, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. What does that mean? <clears throat> he said, I've got a message that heaven and earth both agree on. Jesus is saying, I've got roots in the earth because I am 100% man. I'm the offspring of David. But I've also got roots In heaven, because I'm also 100% God. I'm the bright and morning star. So he's saying that from the root system in the earth and the root system in heaven, that there's one clarion call. There's one testimony. God's got one thing on his mind. He says, I've got something I want to say. I've got something I want to echo to every generation. I've got one primary thing. What is it, Jesus? Verse 17, the spirit and the bride or the Holy Spirit and the church say, come. That's what's on God's heart. You want a word from God, a right now word? What is God saying in this moment? He's saying to you. Come. 
Then he says, and let anyone who hears that call, that clarion message, that sent message from a sent messenger, let anyone who hears it, the word hears there in the Greek means who understands it, let them also say, come. Because once you come to Jesus, you get the real thing. You need to turn around and tell everybody you're connected to one thing. Come. Now, John described the words coming out of Jesus' mouth in Revelation as a two-edged sword. Does that mean a blade came out of his mouth? No. What it means is that it was a sharp word in two directions. Notice the spirit and the church say come. The spirit and the church are pointing one word to two targets. One word to two targets. To heaven, they look up and say, come Lord Jesus. In fact, Jesus told us to pray that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. So the spirit of God that inhabits the earth in this dispensation and the church of Jesus Christ look up to heaven and say, come. But then also, it's a two-edged sword. On the other side of it, the spirit of God and the church look out in a horizontal sense at the world around us. We look out at our families. We look out at our communities. We look out at our cities, at our nation, at our world. And we also say, come. Come to Jesus. Verse 17 continues. He says, let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life, the free gift. That's grace. Grace is what made God's expensive purchase free to you. You were purchased not by silver and gold, the scripture says, but with the precious blood of Jesus. And it was expensive. But grace made the world's most expensive purchase free to you. That's a glory moment right there. So he says, come. In John 7, 38, he talked about the water of life and what it is. He said, whoever believes in me, but but watch this. You can't just have this like mental assent or this vain agreement that Jesus is God. No, that's, that's not how it works. That's not the real thing. That's not how you get it. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, when you get the belief system about Jesus from what the scripture has said, here's the promise. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. That's why Jesus, during the Feast of Tabernacles, stood and cried out with a loud voice. And he said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come unto me, all of you who are thirsty and parched. Come unto me. That was his message. Now, it's interesting. Revelation, last book of the Bible. These are the last couple of verses of the last book of the Bible. And God's got something on his mind that Jesus is saying, the Spirit is saying, and the church is commanded to say. And it's come. But you go back to the book of Genesis God told a man named Noah, I want you to build an ark. Destruction is coming. Judgment is coming. So I want you to build an ark of safety. And I want you to invite everyone you come in contact with to come. It was on God's mind in Genesis. It is on God's mind in Revelation. So my message to you today is simple. Come to Jesus. Come to the church of Jesus Christ. 
come be a part, a member of the body of Christ. Come be a part of the bride of Christ. Come to community. Come to communion. Come to fellowship. Come to worship service on Sundays. Come to Bible study on Wednesday nights. Come to serve in various departments. Come to prayer. Come with your tithes and your offerings and your worship. Come with your gifts and your talents. The Spirit and the bride say, come. It's for anyone that wants it. It does not matter what you have done, where you have been. It does not matter who you are. God says to you this day, come. In hopes that on the other side of that two-edged sword, that beautiful word, in hopes that you would turn to him and say, come. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Come into my church. Come into my community. Come into my family. That that as God aches for you to come, that something would, would begin to transpire in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind, that would begin to yearn for him to come into your life as well. The spirit and the bride say, come. It's 1125. I made a promise. Stand to your feet. Give the Lord a praise. If you have an offering that you would like to give, we do tithe in the beginning of the service, offering at the end. If you have an offering you'd like to give, you can gather it now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that people all over this room, from the front to the back, the ground floor to the balcony, even those watching online, I pray they would come to you. And then I pray they would turn to you and say, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Your word says it's as simple as that, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus in faith shall be saved. So as we turn from ourselves and our ways, as we forsake our lawlessness, as we lift up your word as the standard, let repentance take place in our lives. Let a humbling and a bowing of the spirit, the mind, and the soul, let it be yielded to you. And come, Lord Jesus, we pray. You might pray that with me, just wherever you are. You might just lift a hand. You don't have to come down here, but you just might lift a hand and just say, come, Lord Jesus, to my heart, to my family, to my real life. Give me a real life experience with you in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand praise. If you have something you'd like to give, you can bring it now.